back to life Hear a song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call me into the mark Came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Shout it out, we're alive, it's your life And what a love we found, death can hold us down We shout it out, we're alive, it's your life And what a love we found, death can hold us down We shout it out, we're alive, it's your life Awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens. Moon and stars, they wept The morning sun was dead The savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon him The final breath he gave As heaven looked away The Son of God was laid In darkness A battle in the grave The war and death was waged The power of hell forever broken The crown began to shake Storms to roll away. His perfect love cannot be overcome. No death or is your sting. A resurrected king has rounded you defeated.
I think I can take this off. Obviously, these folks won't mind. You've probably guessed that I'm in a cemetery. And if you know your local sites, you might recognize this cemetery as Lancaster Cemetery in downtown Lancaster City. It was founded in 1846. It's not the oldest cemetery in Lancaster County, but it's pretty old. And there's a lot of famous people that are buried here. Somewhere in these grave sites is the marker for Charles DeMuth, who was apparently a fairly famous artist in the early 1900s. Right beside me here is the grave of Jonathan Foltz, who was the first Surgeon General of the United States Navy. Also somewhere in this graves, grave uh, cemetery is the grave of an American Revolutionary War soldier. Don't know where it is, but I know it's here somewhere. The big marker right behind me is the gravestone for John F. Reynolds, who was the highest ranking general killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. Lancaster native, grew up around here, went off to join the United States Army, had a fairly illustrious career rose to the rank of Major General in the United States Army, and he was killed on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st, 1863. He was buried here. This site, three days later, July 4th, 1863. Why do we erect these monuments? The dead don't care. John Reynolds probably doesn't care about his impressive marker behind me. So why do we erect them? And the answer is so that we remember, so that we have something to tie our memories to. And with that in mind, let's open up to Joshua chapter four. So we're reading from Joshua chapter four, starting in verse one. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up twelve stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant 
had stood, and they are there to this day. Now, tomorrow, we are celebrating Memorial Day. Originally known as Decoration Day, it originated in the years following the Civil War and became an official federal holiday in 1971. Many Americans observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or memorials, holding family gatherings, and participating in parades. Did you know, each year on Memorial Day, a national moment of remembrance takes place at 3 p.m. local time? It's unclear where exactly this tradition originated. Numerous different communities may have independently initiated the memorial gatherings. And some records show that one of the earliest Memorial Day commemorations was organized by a group of freed slaves in Charleston, South Carolina, less than a month after the Confederacy surrendered in 1865. Nevertheless, in 1966, the federal government declared Waterloo, New York, the official birthplace of Memorial Day. Now, like the markers in Lancaster Cemetery, we need to remember. Here's one prayer we all need to remember. Dear Lord, so far today I've done right. I haven't lost my temper, haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that, but in a few minutes I'm going to get out of bed, and then I'm probably going to need a lot more help. I think that one of the good things, if you can call it that, to come out of this virus crisis is that we have been prompted to remember more frequently what God has done for us, how he has sustained and preserved us, and we have been reminded to a great extent that God is in control. Now, we won't have many picnics today, and we certainly won't be having any parades, but we have been reminded to stop and reflect. It's interesting to me as we talk about stones of remembrance in Joshua and the gravestones in the cemetery that stones recorded in the Bible have always been referred to as a marker of what God is doing. Samuel used stones as a memorial for God's goodness. Jesus telling us, if we don't praise the Lord, that even the rocks would cry out. Or when he told Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus rolling away the stone so that the people could see he had been resurrected. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. And of course, our text this morning. Joshua used stones from the Jordan River to build a memorial as a public testimony, acknowledging what God had done and is doing for Israel and for us today. So that's the text. Now, let's next talk about the context of the text. At the point in time when these events take place, Israel had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, where they did things their own way and without God. Joshua was anointed by God to lead God's people in a better and more fulfilled life. This is somewhere around 1250 BC. In Joshua chapter 3, he told the people things like, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. There comes a time to listen, and there comes a time to move. God was telling his people to do both, and not let time pass in between, so that he can accomplish all the things he wants to accomplish, and then be thankful, then reflect. And remember what he has done. All tw 12 tribes had been in the wilderness together, and God wanted all 12 tribes together to come to Canaan at the same time. He commanded them to make a memorial so that they would remember that God had been with them and brought them through the impossible times. The banks of the river were at a flood stage, but when they crossed, the Lord had allowed them to cross safely and on dry land. By the way, this is not an empty lesson. Think back to when they crossed the Red Sea. It took just a few days for the Israelites to forget what God had done so they could cross the Red Sea and escape the Egyptians. And there they were, melting gold and worshiping a calf they had made. So God used this object lesson 
so the Israelites would not forget what he had done. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So, that's the text. That's the context. How do we put into action our study so that its application has consequences? How do we make a memorial meaningful and beneficial in our lives? You see, consequences go both ways. Action, reaction. Omission, commission. If we remember about God and what he has done, we are moved closer to God. Just pause and think back on the most important moment in your life, the day and the hour that you got saved. And then think of the many times since then that God has provided for you and sustained you. We can even think about the times that the mighty hand of the Lord intervened and we didn't even know it. Do we really think we know of every instance that God has intervened to protect or sustain us? Not even close. But when I pause to remember the times that I do know about, the consequences are that I feel closer to God. And that is exactly what he is looking for. But there can be negative consequences as well. When we don't remember, when we forget, we drift away. As we do, God and the things of God become less important. When we don't focus on God, the only thing we do focus on is ourselves, our lives, our wants, and even our own strength. When we forget what God has done, we begin to think that we have done it. I know that's true for me. Now, I don't recall ever using the exact words of Nebuchadnezzar, but the spirit is there. If you want, uh, turn to Daniel chapter 4, or perhaps you can think back to the sight and sound version of uh, Daniel. But Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 29, tells the story. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His sanity was restored is another way of saying he remembered. So on this Memorial Day, what I want to remember as I look back on this virus crisis and recall is not the events of the quarantine, but to remember what God has done to preserve sustain, and provide. For me, there are four ways I can make these stones of remembrance mean something and use the consequences of the text to have an effect on my life. By not forgetting, by being intentional, by making a difference, and by sharing the experience. Let's look at these one by one. First, by not forgetting. Perhaps it seems like the most obvious. But Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. All the things that God did for Israel, you would think that they would not forget. They did, in fact, as I said before. In mere days, they forgot about God and reverted back to their old way of thinking and their old way of life. We need memorials. We're no better than the Israelites because we have short memories too. 
In fact, as humans, we have really odd memories. It's really unique and interesting the things that we remember or don't remember. Let me give you an example. I haven't played golf in a very long time, but I can still remember the moment of the furthest ball I ever hit. I can remember the sound the club made when it hit the ball. I remember watching that ball fly straight and true. And that was unique for me because I had a vicious right hook. It was a gorgeous, crisp fall day. I remember the smell of the grass and the rustle of the leaves and the feel of the sun on my cheek. And this was not a short time ago either. This would have been in the very early 80s, well over 30 years ago. On the flip side, I cannot remember what I had for breakfast. My short-term memory is terrible. I need to write everything down or I will forget. I'm thankful for Facebook so I know when people's birthdays are. But that's the way human nature is. We remember the things that are important. The golf moment was not really important, but for some reason, I'll never forget it. But I will also never forget the day I truly accepted the Lord to be Lord of my life. I remember the day that I married my wife, the day each one of my children were born. They get put in special files in my mind that hopefully cannot be erased or misplaced. But things I do forget are the day-to-day significance of my relationship with God. By the way, full transparency. Remember the message I preached back before the first of the year? A three-point plan for a phenomenal new year? The three P's were proximity, position, and posture. Proximity, I need to move closer to God through prayer. Position, I need to learn more about God through His Word. Posture, I need to serve God by serving people. So, to be fully transparent, I have been faithful in my one-year Bible reading plan. 42% done. Not as well as I would like regarding prayer, And I haven't done anything intentional to serve people. So I need to get more active in remembering the convictions that God has given me. Which brings me to number two, being intentional. Putting a string on my finger may be cute, but it's not a guarantee that I will remember. Now, I told you that I could remember that golf day. I can also remember the day I accepted Christ as my Savior. It was in August 1986. The day that I truly found Christ. The day that I committed to who was first in my life. And every day since then has been an ongoing struggle to live out that commitment. Every action since then has to measure against what I did with Christ and not Christ fitting into everything else. Here's the thing about measuring. Sometimes when you measure, you fall short. You know the saying, measure twice, cut once, and sometimes you're right on target, but lots of times, not so much. But, and here's the key, at least by measuring, we are intentional about the actions we undertake and the standard by which we measure. We may fall short, but it is far better to measure and realize it than to forget and not know. The point about intentionality is that we do things in a way that is planned or intended. Another word would be deliberate. Intentional is not happenstance. It does not happen by accident. Intentional means that we have an awareness of the end to be achieved. Intentional is a readiness and willingness to achieve the end result. Christ-likeness cannot be done on our own, but it cannot be done by accident either. By remembering and being intentional, we are seeing God do some amazing things, and we trust Him to do many more things in the days to come. If you remember my three-point plan for a phenomenal new year, you remember that I like to think in threes. In thinking about being intentional, I think that I need to be intentional in three ways. First, by looking up. I want to be intentional in worshiping God, in putting Him first and in learning more about him. Second, by looking in. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. There are many verses about guarding the heart and having the mind of Christ. I need to be intentional about what I put in my spiritual body. 
Physical body is a lost cause during the quarantine because I've been very free in feeding my stomach. But I need to be intentional in feeding my mind. And thirdly, by looking out. One of the things I love about this church is that we are intentional about how we reach this community for Christ. That everything we do keeps us on course and on focus with that intentional action. We are a community church, and I love the things Mannheim Grace Brethren Church does to impact our community. So, the first thing I want the memorial stones in my life to remind me is to remember. The second thing is to be purposeful and intentional. The third thing is to make a difference. You know, any monument set up to glorify man will fall or rust or break. Trophies, plaques, ribbons, Help us to remember our accomplishments, but we must remember that without God's help, we would not be able to do those things. Those stones placed on the banks of the River Jordan were for Israel to remember that it was God's strength and power that brought them out of Egypt, and His power that held back the waters so they could not only cross, but cross on dry land. At some moment in time, the land on which Mannheim Grace Brethren Church sits was barren, with nothing on it. Now, years later, there is a church community, alive and vibrant, living square in its mission to make an impact in this community. It was God who put it here, and He has met our needs all these years to get us to where we are today. William Arthur Ward said, Do more than belong. Participate. Do more than care. Help. Do more than believe. Practice. Do more than be fair. Be kind. Do more than forgive. Forget. Do more than dream. Work. So, remember, be intentional, make a difference, and lastly, share your story. The monument of the stones were put there to be a remembrance to the parents. They were to remember to share the story of God's goodness to their kids. You've heard the saying, Christianity is only one generation away from being extinct. That is because each generation is to pass down to the next the good news of Christ. We are to remember and then share. We do not have to be a preacher. We need to be a storyteller. We all have a story. We all have experiences where God intervened in our life. We all have a faith account, not a golf story but a story of a time where we knew God directly intervened in our life in a meaningful way. So let me tell you a story. I will date myself a little bit by telling you it's a story about a time in my life when I tried to fix a TV. I found a big TV cabinet in a yard sale, but the TV itself wasn't working, and I didn't want to pay lots of money to fix it. So I was trying to replace the TV tube and make this thing work. So I'm trying to mount this tube into this piece of furniture, and I learned something I didn't know before. A TV picture tube is under pressure. And as I'm scraping the metal band that mounted the old tube to the cabinet, my eyes were about eight inches from the tube, and it exploded. I'll never forget the boom that it made. Now, I had a living room that was about 14 feet by 20 feet, and I was in one corner of that room, and there were little pieces of glass in every square inch of that room. It was in my hair and my clothes and my pockets, but not one shard of glass went into my eyes. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God preserved me that day. I also need to remember to tell people what he has done for me, then and since. We have a chance to make a difference by telling what God has done in our lives. We all have Red Sea picture tube experiences. God is glorified when we tell the stories of what he has done for us. I can't think of a message about remembering and forgetting without turning to the book of Revelation. So fast forward about 1,400 years to the very end of the Bible both canonically and chronologically. And let's look at Revelation chapter 2. In the book of Revelation is the account of the church at Ephesus. John recalls these words of Jesus. I know your works, 
your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and I have and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Now, I don't want to take a scripture out of context and twist its purpose to make a point, but in this, it fits in what we're talking about this morning. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Nevertheless means that all the good in the Ephesian church did not cancel out the bad that Jesus is about to describe. They have left, not lost, their first love. Though they had left their first love, everything looked great on the outside. If you would have attended a service at the church in Ephesus, you might have thought, wow, this is a happening church. They're doing so much. But they have forgotten. And because they have forgotten, they no longer remember their first love. They have left. But what did they leave? Did they leave their love for God? Did they leave their love for one another? Possibly both, probably neither. Remember, they left, not lost, their first love. The Ephesian church was a working church. The reality then and now is that sometimes a focus on working for Jesus will eclipse a love relationship with him and with his people. So let's overlay what Jesus wanted the church at Ephesus to do with the points I described above. To not forget, to be intentional, to make a difference, and to share the experience. Jesus told the church at Ephesus, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. The first step that Jesus says in the restoration for the Ephesian church is for them to remember exactly what God told Joshua to the Israelites in Gilgal. The next thing Jesus says is, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and then he says, Repent. The second step is to repent. Now, this is not a command to feel sorry or be remorseful. It means to change your direction, to go a different way. Being willing to change direction where needed is the mark of a mature believer and a mature organization. And third, Jesus tells them to do the first works. That means they must go back to the basics, to the very first things they did when they first fell in love with Jesus. We never grow beyond these things. And that means we will never lose the love of the stories that got us to him. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they have taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until it had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Many people that we know have fought the good fight and gone on to be with the Lord. Others that we know, and a great many that we don't, have fought and died for our freedom and our prosperity. And it's important to remember them. But it's even more important to remember and live for the one who died for us and the one who promised that we would never be alone, even in the toughest of times. So, on this Memorial Day, my very best wishes. I hope you enjoy the day tomorrow, whatever you have planned probably won't be any picnics, certain there won't be any parades, but nonetheless, have a happy Memorial Day. And if I can be allowed to interject a personal note, next Sunday, May 31st, marks the final time that Pastor Jeff will be preaching to us as our pastor. Later that day, from 2 until 4 p.m., there is an informal drop-in planned. On this theme of remembrance, I'm looking forward to sharing a note of encouragement for Pastor Jeff and Ruthie for what they have done for this church and what they have meant to me and my family. 
There is a more formal service planned for August, when hopefully things will be back to some semblance of normal, and we can gather again. But next Sunday, drop in, 2 to 4 p.m., and share your memories and your encouragement. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry the kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing and I All my failures I try to hide It was my turn Till I met you You got my name Yeah. 